Hi, I'm Caitlin Holm. I'm a senior data scientist with Open Data Collaborative. Today I'm going to be presenting on data analysis and visualization. Thank you for inviting me to share with you what we've been doing at Open Data Collaboratives in Africa and the Middle East in building open data portals and preparing data. I'm going to start by explaining what open data is, what it looks like, then I'll use some examples to show you what you can do with open data. And lastly, we're gonna work through the process ourselves of finding, cleaning, and visualizing data sets. What is open data? Open data is data and information content that can be freely used, modified, and shared by anyone for any purpose. When you hear people talk about open data, the open part just refers to the permissions and the usage around that data. Any appropriate data can become open data. And being open doesn't change the data itself. It just indicates the status of how accessible that data is. Since open data is all about access, it's important to remember that when using, creating, and publishing open data, that that data can be accessed and read by people and machines. We call, the, we call that data human and machine readable. When we talk about data, it's not always just numbers on a spreadsheet, though it can be. Data can come in all sorts of forms. It can be maps, infographics, images, statistics books, PDFs, government reports, even social media metrics. All of those things can be data. When you think of open data, I want you to think about information and knowledge that is free for you to have and free for you to give. Now that you know what open data is, let me get more specific about the types of open data that are out there. Uh, open data is used in a lot of different fields. Some of them may seem obvious, like government data, which can include information about the population, to health data, which might feature statistics on the leading cause of death or common COVID symptoms in your area, to financial data about the average price of a hotel room or the history of inflation, to communication and media, which could tell you how much, tra how much traction and interest an article has generated. And that's just to name a few. All of these sectors collect data and all of these sectors can choose to make their data public. So, but why would they? Why would the government, for instance, share data? And why would they do it for free? <laughs> well, opening up data, um, sharing it with you for free actually comes with a lot of benefits. Uh, so let's look at government, for example. By opening up government data, the government can improve efficiency, it can improve service delivery because now you know who and what is in need. Uh, it can comply with regulations and you can see that the government itself is complying with the regulations that have been set out. It also communicates better with people and businesses when you open up your data. It provides transparency. And from there, all of those work together to drive innovation and economic growth. So our world is actually filled with open data, but that's not obvious if you don't know where to look for it. And individual organizations don't always share the information that's needed. Uh, and if even if you do know where to look for it, it can be hard to know where to begin. This is where governments have the opportunity and responsibility to promote and empower their citizens and businesses by providing more and better data. So uh, we've come to know that governments, the data that citizens are most interested in is economic data, education and learning, analytics and insight, civic programs, citizen engagement, and transparency.
So now I'm interested to see what data you all find most interesting. So what are you most interested in finding? What do you think will uh, help you on your data journey? Uh, what challenges are you currently facing that data could help with? So if you can just, uh, there's a chat feature. If you can just enter into the chat the type of data that you would be looking for, um, then uh, we'll either address it through this workshop or I'd be happy to get in contact with you later and we can, and I can help you to find it. Um, so that'd be that'd be great. So just post that in the chat now. So now let's look at some examples of data in action in Africa. Open Data Collaboratives, my company, worked with the government of Ghana in 2017 to host the fourth Africa Open Data Conference, the AODC. Uh, we had more than 700 participants and the Africa Open Data Conference brought together people from all over the world. A large, we also trained a large number of youth and I myself, in fact, attended training there uh, on a very similar session to what I'm giving now. Uh, we even had at the conference, uh, we even had the president of Ghana speak, which was really exciting. I was really ex glad to see that. Uh, at the AODC, we held a session. So importantly, at the AODC, we held a session there on smart cities, which uh, provided the opportunity for leaders of their cities to get together and using open data that could improve life in several cities. And the Open Data Institute, in fact, provided a small grant to do that work. We're very thankful for that. Uh, the project set out, the project that was chosen, set out to improve the cleanliness of streets and was called the Clean Streets Project. The Clean Streets Project is pretty miraculous in my, or pretty marvelous in my opinion. Uh, it, uh, with the, within the Clean Streets Project, four cities were chosen, Kampala, Uganda, Accra, Ghana, Los Angeles in the USA, and Bo, Sierra Leone. Each city used the same method to work with the public to report trash on the street, and they rated their streets with a one, two, or three as to the level of trash. Los Angeles had been using this method for a few years and found it to be helpful. The way that the uh, the way that the cities decided to approach this challenge to clean up the streets uh, was through a seven step process. They gathered data. So they would send out either teams of people or individuals and different cities approach this a little bit differently, but they would go out and gather the data. Where is this happening? Uh, where are there dumps uh, of refuse and rubbish? Then they would take that data and they would score it. So they'd score the streets and that would give a concise and informative data point that could then be shared. Uh, then they would engage, most importantly, engage and train the community. So it wasn't just about collecting data, but it was about uh, empowering and teaching the local community to uh, collect the data on their own and what to do with that data. So it's not enough just to say that there was a dumping zone here, but then what do you do with that information? This then activated governments. That was the next step was to activate governments to come up with a response. Then measure the outcomes. So how, what was the impact of this 
what was the impact of this process, this challenge? Were was it successful? And how do you rate that success? Is it success just a disappearance of uh, dumping spaces, or is do you measure success based on how uh, educated the community is, how engaged they were? Is there a group that's now set out and excited about carrying on this work? Then the next step was to understand the data. So after collecting all of the data about where the rubbish was, the scores from the streets, how engaged the community was, how activated the government was, their responses and their outcomes, so to, under, to gather all that data and to understand what it was really saying um, about this approach, about this project, about this challenge, and, and where might there be uh, areas that uh, we can change, that we can adjust, that uh, we can learn from each other moving forward to create a more sustainable project. Uh, it was also important that the data be kept up to date. So after uh, maybe after the rubbish was cleared, did that data then disappear or not disappear? Was that data then removed? Uh, in the sense that it no longer indicated that there was rubbish there, or did it linger on? And then how did that did that data adjust and reflect the changes in where new rubbish pits had begun? So it was really important in that uh, in that sense to work with the local governments and companies so that way they knew where to pick up the trash uh, in a relevant uh, for the relevant locations. Now, each of the teams took a slightly different approach, which was awesome because it allowed uh, everyone to learn from each other. And it also meant that each approach fit the community that they were working in. It was it's all a similar problem, but there's different, uh, but these are three different countries that are working to working together towards the same goal, and each of those countries would require a different approach. So these approaches used uh, different software tools like ArcGIS, which is a mapping software um, that allows you to create layers and different pins. And they also used OpenStreetMaps, which is an amazing resource. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk about that later uh, if we have time and if there's interest. Um, and it was important what, uh, what these tools and mapping allowed us, to, allowed us to do was to have an exact marker at the location of the trash. So it could be picked up. It wasn't enough to just say, oh, it's somewhere over there between these two buildings, where exactly was it? Which two buildings? Which side of the street was it on? Um, and so uh, so all of this information, all of this data was then collated and presented, visualized in a map. And through that visualization as a map, it was easier to address the problem. You could see, is it happening in is there a hot spot here? And maybe there's a reason for that happening in, in this area. Maybe there's something, I know in Los Angeles, we had an issue where there weren't enough garbage cans in a specific area. And so people were dumping their trash or we had areas that weren't uh, heavily trafficked and people would go there frequently to dump their trash. Um, so it was really useful to be able to see quickly, to have a quick visual reference of the area where the trash was. And in this case, the visualization of that data changed the approach. Here in Accra, so we're done talking about Los Angeles. Here in Accra, uh, Mobile Web Ghana was chosen. And shout out to Mobile Web Ghana for hosting this conference. Uh, they um, created a mobile app. So we talked about maps. And then but there's also applications. Uh, they created a mobile app that let people create a service request 
for trash that they that they saw and then report it. So it was a way to get the community engaged on the ground uh, in a kind of a grassroots manner uh, to help uh, to address something that was impacting them directly. In Kampala, they hired Boda Boda drivers to take mappers around the city and tag the trash's geolocation. So the map comes back into play. Uh, so sanitation services could remove it. And this was actually a pretty exciting day when this happened. And all the border border drivers were very excited. Uh, I remember when they had their training uh, and they got to like take the morning off and just drive around the city and get used to using the application and were incredibly excited and engaged in, in data. <laughs> and so there's, it's, when we talk about open data, it's important to know that it's not just numbers and it's not just spreadsheets, but it really is a, a way, a vehicle for people to engage in their community. All So our lessons learned. All four projects made progress on improving cleanliness, gathering and using open data, training non-data scientists, that's like with the Boda Boda drivers who I just mentioned, and building relationships with the government to act on data. That's because with access to data, you can do amazing things. So this was just one example that shows how releasing and using open data empowers people to make better decisions and it empowers the local community to change the issues that they uh the to address the challenges that they're experiencing in a way that they wouldn't without data they wouldn't be able to without data so now that you've heard some, now that we know what data is, you've heard an example of how data has been used. Let's, we're going to shift now to more of a workshop and I'm going to show you how to find data. So let's see if anyone has uh, said anything like that. In the chat, we have oh, health and COVID data and gender disaggregated data. Okay, well, we will speak on both of those in just a bit. Um, those are both really good, uh, really good and really relevant topics. So I'm, thank you for staying engaged and I'd be happy to address those in just a bit. So let's look at finding data, like COVID data. Uh, to find data, you need to know who has open data. So remember from earlier, we talked about who uses data. Remember we said like the government uses data, but also there's financial data. Um, and there's also uh, communications data and there's data put out by environmental groups. Well, now we are taking a look to see, uh, so just as that data, uh, was used in different fields. The data is actually, the, the data is published in different fields as well. So uh, there isn't just one source for open data. When you're looking for open data, you're probably going to want to look for more than one source too. So we're getting data from different places. We talked about the government and uh, ministries, but we also get data from organizations. That's like the World Bank. And we get data from cities, like, for instance, um, school data. School data, for example, can come from individual schools, but also from the national government and organizations that support schools, like UNICEF. At each of those different levels, the data collection and publication will look 
different. So, and the data itself could be different. So if you're having trouble finding the data you need, it's important to look in multiple sources. For example, with school data, the school, the local school, the school itself may have data on the uh, areas that their students live in, right? They might have the addresses for where the students live. They may have uh, how many students uh, attending the school are from the same family. But you wouldn't see that same type of data at the national level. At the national level, they might have data on how many teachers are at the school. How long have the teachers been teaching at that school? When was the school opened? How many students are attending? Then when you look at uh, organizations like UNICEF, for example, it might have information about how much funding is going to the school, how, what are the re uh, student retention rates and graduation rates. So those are all very different data sets, but for your challenge, you might need data from each one of those. That's why it's important to look at the different levels that data is collected and the different layers that it can be published in. Now, it's not just, now it's important to note that when we talk about collecting data with the uh, uh, Clean Streets example, that was a, an example of data being collected by people. However, data is also collected by machines. And in fact, it's generated by machines as well. Data are smart. There's lots of things in our lives that generate data from smartphones to smart cars, smart people, uh, sensors, RFID, and cameras. All of those things produce data and they're producing data all the time. Those are good sources for when we're looking for data. Those are good sources to remember to look into, especially because things like smartphones can tell you your location, but it can also tell you other things too. Um, like with cameras, cameras can tell you, uh, you know, the type of weather patterns that day, but they can also look into traffic and tell you how busy was this road. Uh, was there Were there a lot of pedestrians around? So it's important to match when you're looking for data, it's important to look for the, to look for a variety of different sources, potential sources. Now, one of the greatest resources for data is the internet. <laughs> when, but it can be tricky to navigate. When it comes to finding data online, though, there are some standard places to, to look, to start out with. And by no means is this a comprehensive list. It's not a complete list, but it will give you a jumping off position to begin finding your data. So you want to look at things like government websites. Those generally have uh, open and free data, right? We want to find free data if we can. We don't want to have to pay for it. Uh, and we uh, uh, also want to look at published reports. So they can also come from the government. Then we want to look at statistics books. Statistics books are a great resource for finding data because they... Uh, are generally printed each year. And so you can find large spans of data across large periods of time. So some I've, some statistics books go all the way back to the 60s, some even further. Some statistics books uh, gather data just over the last 10 years. But what's nice about those types of statistics books is once they're printed, they generally don't disappear. So sometimes on a government website, as the data is updated, the previous years or the previous iterations of data slowly disappear off the web page just because you can't host, just because sometimes you can't host all of that data in the uh, 
with through the website format. Uh, so I really recommend statistics books. They have a lot of information um, and they're a good place to look if you are not quite sure where to begin. Then there's also infographics. So this is a different type of visualization uh, that we will get into a little bit later, but they are a great resource for finding data online because they gather data in a quick readable format uh, that is generally sourced. And so you can find out some more, but just with a glance, you're able to learn uh, quite a bit about the topic. Then there's research organizations. This is like UNICEF, the World Bank. They generally do their own reports and publish uh, data related to their findings, which is sometimes different than government data, but, uh, and sometimes it also includes uh, international data, which may be useful if you're trying to draw a comparison. Then there's also universities, which, are an often overlooked <laughs> resource, but if you're having trouble finding a specific data set, they're always one of the number one places I recommend to go to. Universities uh, are almost always excited to help and, and to teach, and they oftentimes have very specific nuanced data that, that they're excited to share. Um, I've also included a toolkit that's the link at the bottom. Don't worry, I will share it in the chat and I'll share it at the end as well. That includes sources for open data for African nations specifically. And that's gonna be a Google Sheet that has uh, several sources, links to them, information about them uh, that I've personally gone through. They're all free, they're all open and they are waiting for you to access them. So next we're going, oh, then also I wanted to mention that there is a new feature in Google that filters just for data sources. The same way that it's the same way that you can select images or web or news uh, or videos, I believe you can click on uh, data. Uh, you can search for data sets in a similar way. So you can go to data set search dot research.google.com <clears throat> and then enter the keyword. There's gonna be search by the top, enter the keywords for the data you're looking for. And that'll pull up a series of results where you can also filter by the last updated date, um, whether or not it's free to use, the licensing restrictions, the format, the topic, uh, so it's a, it's a really great resource. Only sites that have, uh, however, it's important to note that only sites that have data, such as a CSV file, which I'll get into a little bit later, that's a comma separated values, um, or an XLS, that's Excel, uh, will be returned. So along with the metadata about the site, uh, so you can decide which sites are reliable and relevant. It doesn't it requires you to filter and decide how uh, how uh, much trust you're going to put in that data. Um, it's also important to note that this isn't uh, limited to just open data. So some of this data you might might be behind a paywall, but it like I said, it's a good place to uh, start with. And a lot of times, if you contact an organization asking for a specific data set or saying that you're doing some research or you're interested in some data they've produced, they will almost always get back to you. So if you see that the data that you want is stuck behind a paywall, try reaching out to the organization. They are almost always excited to share that and uh, happy that you are interested. And generally, you can find out a little bit more information that way too. So I just mentioned a word that you may or may not be familiar with called metadata. And I'm gonna now focus, now that we've found some tools for how to find our data. How do we look to see if, how do we look to see if we want to use that data? Is that data recent? Is it reliable? Is it applicable? All of that information is going to be found in the metadata. When you find data or when you're organizing data, 
you are going to add your metadata. If you're looking at data that has already been published, you're going to look at the metadata. But if you're going to be collating or creating a new data set, you're going to need to create it. The metadata is sounds kind of complicated, but it's not. Uh, it's just information that describes what the information is about. So it's metadata. Your metadata is going to provide a context and insight into the data. And most importantly, metadata is how people are going to find your data. So once you've published it, you want to make sure that you include that metadata so people can find it and use it. The things that you're going to include in your metadata is going to be data about the data, the title, the original URL, that the data was found at. Uh, sometimes you'll want to make sure that when you're looking for data that you uh, always include the source that it came from, the description, what the data is about, the theme. Uh, so that could be something like health or gender, keywords, the language that the data is in. This is really important uh, because it, uh, sometimes you'll find the perfect data set and it is not in a language you speak, or you're looking for data from a country that whose language you're not familiar with, and uh, you would like to know whether or not you're going to be able to read it. You'll also include the file format, the data owner, the contact, so who you can contact uh, if there's a problem with the data or if you'd like updated version, the last time it was updated, the year that the data ends, and sometimes the year the data begins, the date that the data was created, and the date that it was published. It seems like a lot, but uh, you'll see, I'll give an example in a bit and it'll be a little more clear. So, uh, So it's important to know, as I said, that your metadata is how people are going to find your data. So make sure that you do it and uh, include it and tie it to the correct data set. When we talk about metadata and when you're creating metadata, you wanna make sure that it's meaningful. So you want it to be specific and you don't wanna use common words like percent, number, type, ratio, or year. Instead, you want to be complete and accurate. If you're not sure what to include, look at the column headings and the descriptions and the context. And this will uh, give you some ideas of what to include in your metadata. But remember, you want your metadata to be meaningful and distinct so that way people find your data set and, and they don't have to go searching through it for a bunch through a bunch of other data sets that include things like, you know, percent in it, percent, percent of what? Here's an example of metadata. Here is, let's look at this small chart, this temperature forecast in Galway, Ireland. Here, so that's going to be your chart, and we're going to create some metadata for it. There's the metadata that you're going to end up creating is just this little uh, piece at the bottom. So the portion on the top is your data set. That's the spreadsheet. And then the bottom is the published data. And you can see that little section at the bottom, that's the metadata. So it seems like a lot from that slide before, there's a lot of things you have to list, but as you can see, it's it's pretty much, uh, it's not too overwhelming, but it actually is really important to include. So this one says when it was created, last updated, and it says who did each of those, the where the code is available, so where you can find the raw data. Um, and then it gives, sometimes your metadata can give little notes to help the, to help understand the data. And that is metadata. Now, uh, we're going to move on to cleaning data. <sighs> cleaning data. You could ask any data scientist and they will tell you that they spend more time cleaning data than doing anything else. 
Now, most data doesn't start out ready to be published. You have to process that data first and that data or process that data first. And that process is called cleaning the data. So it takes that messy data that's maybe in the wrong format, that isn't quite coherent, and it cleans it so that it's more readable. And I'll explain what this means with uh, a few steps and a few steps and examples. Most data, uh, so when we talk about data being messy, uh, it could be in the wrong format. It could have too many variables. It could be comparing uh, two things that you cannot compare, like years and uh, the number of camels. Those are not one and the same. Um, so we need to address those issues before we can publish it. To make it ready for publication, we're going to go through a few steps and we're gonna convert it. We're going to format it, do a quality check. And our last step is publish. By doing these steps, we're going to make the data machine readable and human readable. Now, sometimes when you've, or sometimes when you finish cleaning the data, your metadata will change and that's okay. It's, if your metadata changes, then that just means that you've learned more about your data set and your, capable of being more specific. Metadata can change over time. The first step that we just spoke about was converting data into a machine readable format. So for example, let's look at a PDF. When you get a PDF, you might not think that there's any data in there because it's not machine readable. It is pie charts and graphs and tables. and there isn't a way to copy and paste. You can't click on it. You can't highlight anything. Uh, however, uh, since a lot of government data is only released as a PDF or a report there, and you probably don't have access to the original spreadsheet, you're gonna have to use the PDF as your data source. Now, there are a few ways that we can do this, few little sneaky ways that we can do this. And, the way that we extract data from a PDF or from a source that isn't machine readable is called scraping. So by scraping the data from the table, we transform it into something that is machine readable. So when you hear people talk about scraping data, it's just the process of importing data from one source, like a PDF, into a spreadsheet. That's it. So here you can see an example of a table. And uh, this was scraped using a program called Tabula. And there's, of course, a few little issues that you're going to have to encounter, little uh, places where you're just going to have to correct. But this is exactly what Tabula uh, produced. So it's the data that matches the top report. And uh, then uh, now you can start analyzing it and processing that data. So I just mentioned Tabula, There's, but there are other resources you can do too. You can use as well to convert files from PDF. So there's Adobe Acrobat DC, though I think you do have to pay for that one. Um, and But I, however, Tabula is the program that I found to be the best, especially when working with large documents, like some of these statistics books, which can be 300 pages and have 900, uh, 900 tables in them. Tabula is a great resource. It grabs all of that data and puts it into one spreadsheet so you can use and reference and uh, have all of the data together. You're not constantly clicking on different spreadsheets to try to analyze when you're analyzing your data. You do, however, uh, so Tabula is, I believe, free, um, but you need to be aware of, I would caution you against using free online tools. These are like the kind that you enter through your browser, uh, especially when you're converting confidential data. Uh, so like specific health data, uh, I'd be would uh, caution you don't use free online tools for that because once it's entered 
some some programs what they do is they will publish that data and once it's published you no longer have uh, uh, access to or you no longer can restrict its privacy there's also ways to convert uh, other files. So Excel is human readable. So for example, Excel. Excel is human readable, but not machine readable. So when we say machine readable, we mean not just is it a spreadsheet that I, that can be read in Excel, but can it be read in other programs like R or MATLAB? Uh, Excel, unfortunately, cannot. So. Uh, but there is a type of file that can, and that's called a CSV, a comma separated values. Um, and uh, you can convert Excel into CSV. CSV is kind of the gold standard for uh, keeping your data uh, clean and readable. So uh, when, and when you're using Excel, make sure that you have a backup of your data saved as a CSV file. Uh, you can convert, you can use both Excel and Google Sheets. The save as function there will convert your data spreadsheet into different types of uh, formats. Another way that you can convert your data is to use scripts. Scripts can help you convert your data quickly, but they do take some time to set up initially. So this can be useful if you have a lot of files um, or have collated a lot of data sets from different sources. But do be aware that uh, it does take some time to set up uh, initially. So we do these steps to convert data to convert the files because it's important that you offer your data in multiple formats when you're ready to publish. So remember, open data, human and machine readable. So if it can't be opened by a machine, it can't be accessed. And if it can't be accessed, it's not open data. So when you're publishing, make sure to publish in multiple formats so people using different types of machines and uh, can open it. And that way people in the future who are using different types of programs that we have not yet foreseen are able to open them as well. Now we're going to talk about how to ensure the quality of the data set. Uh, step one, uh, run a spell check. So run a spell check program before you publishing your data. If the data will be published in multiple languages, and sometimes it is. So like, for instance, this data set is both in English and in Arabic, but you could be have one that's in English and French, one that is in, um, you could do, uh, Russian and Spanish. Uh, it just depends. Um, you need to, so when you have data that contains two languages, you need to proofread the data in both languages. And there's software you can use. So there's Google Translate. There is, there's several different softwares that you can use. Um, there's even like browser extensions. Uh, but the best thing to do is to, when you're dealing with data, is to actually check with someone who can speak both languages before, you're pu before you publish. Uh, because it can, sometimes the nuances of a specific word don't always translate exactly, don't always translate correctly. Uh, so you can have um, issues, like, so I've seen a problem, I've had a problem in a data set before with the translation of uh, antenatal. And uh, that had translating between Arabic and English with antenatal uh, ended up being quite a problem, <laughs> um, especially with how does that fit in with neonatal and is it referring to uh, specific issues that the woman encountered or that the child encountered. So it's important to have someone who speaks both languages that can point you in the right direction. Um, even when data sets seem pretty organized, like this one that you can see here, the, they can oftentimes have spelling errors, especially in multiple languages. So here you can see that this is a government published data set from a statistics book. This is how it appeared in a statistics book. Um, and you can see that they misspelled the word purple. So uh, the red circle is supposed to refer to uh, it's supposed to be the word purple, which refers to a type of uh, pipe, 
the color of the pipe, which refers to a tip, uh, the type of, I think it's like non-potable water um, is carried in a purple pipe. But if you didn't know, uh, if you didn't know that and you weren't familiar with sprinkler systems or uh, the water regulations, you would have, and didn't speak Arabic, there would be no way to understand what Pupler meant. Now we're going to look at, uh, you also need to be aware, excuse me, you also need to be aware of variations in your data. So you may find that there are gaps missing uh, in your data. So missing years or months, as, as you can see in this example. Um, and this can be a problem because the machine can read that as a zero instead of an empty cell. So if you're taking an average, that could uh, affect your data. Um, or what can happen sometimes is that it will actually take the numbers, the next number that it sees and apply that as if it was in the first cell. So here you would see that in Friday, January 1st, the year 2010, uh, it would say that the number of it could say that the number of visits what look like the number of visits was 361 instead of that number not being recorded. So it's important to uh, figure. So it's important to notate when a cell is intentionally left empty. So you can do that with a dash or with an n slash a. Uh, if it legitimately is a zero, you can put a zero in there. But make sure that you address empty cells in a way that makes sense for the data and makes it clear and obvious that that cell should be empty. Uh, there may be changes also in the methodology of the data collection over time. So for instance, this data set went to showing daily data to an average data across a six month period. And you can see that with 2010, 621. <laughs> so this data set is by no means uh, ready to be published, but it is a good example here of what to be aware of. The other thing to look at is special characters. Oftentimes you'll encounter special characters when you're working with data and these need to be written out. So a superscript, for example, needs to have that caret sign next to it. Um, you need to keep the a plus becomes the word plus, a division sign becomes the divide units go in your parentheses. Uh, and with accents, you need to make sure that they show up in both, uh, they show up in whatever format you're using. So uh, you can see here where I've circled, these three data sets are all meant to go together in a collection, but there's different notation for all of them. Uh, that needs to be corrected. The other, another issue you need to be aware of is uh, mixed languages. So when you're dealing with two uh, multilingual data set, it's important to leave the data in the language it was created in and to provide translation to any other needed languages. So if the data set is uh, in French, but it needs to be readable by people who are in English, you can translate that from French to English. That's okay, that's not adding data, that's just clarifying. But it is important you ha you should always leave the original language it was created, and that prevents issues like the Pupler purple that we saw a few slides ago. The, through uh, by leaving it in this original language, I was able to go back and see that the word was purple. It's also important to avoid using all caps. Uh, it is machine readable, but it just doesn't look good. <laughs> um, avoid capital, avoid using all caps and use, um, use, use the appropriate case where it applies. Uh, it's also important to look for, to clean up formatting. So look for formatting that has been copied over, but isn't, isn't, um, uh, but has been duplicated. So here you can see where these dashes are. We actually also have those indicate that I like a little bullet point under cement, but there's also no, it's also notated with an A, B, and C. That needs to be reconciled. So you should just have one indicator where necessary. Don't duplicate data. 
Uh, it's also important to avoid merging cells. So it can be really tempting when you're working with big data sets to want to merge your cells together uh, to keep things looking clean and nice, but that can be a real problem when your data gets converted into another format or when someone is using a different program to view the data. Uh, so it's important to avoid merged cells where possible. And you can do this by going in and changing the titles of those individual uh, cells in that second row. So it's also important to note too that merged cells don't carry over into other programs. So it was just, so this data set would end up just looking like it would have three totals, but those totals wouldn't be connected to anything. So it wouldn't be total number of accents, it would just be total. Uh, you can, here is the way that you can address that. So as you can see here, I've changed the number of accidents. I've changed the first uh, row to number of accidents, comma, total number of accidents with injuries, number of accidents, no injuries. There are different ways you can do this, but it's important that that data stays together. Don't want any merge cells. Now there's some behind the scenes things that you also need to fix and be aware of. So there's an issue with UK versus US spelling. So labor versus labor, color versus color, organize versus organize. These are things just to clean up on the back end. You also need to be aware of spelling variations in place names and terms and make sure that you're using the most up-to-date uh, name of a specific location. And you also want to make sure that you're using the name of the location that the people reading the data will be familiar with. Once you're done with this, you might need to add and adjust your metadata. And that's okay. Your metadata should always reflect the data as it's published and as it's presented. So as it goes, as your data goes through the cleaning process, your metadata is probably going to change. Lastly, we're going to go to visualizing data. So once you've done all of that, uh, you get to go to the jazzy part, uh, the visualizing data. As we've seen, open data can come in all sorts of forms. So it can come in maps and infographics, but it can also come in the form of clean streets, right? It can come in the form of school data. It can come in the form of gender segregated data. Um, However, the but visualizing data is what's going to help us to uh, study and interpret all those different forms. So visualizing data is one of the key aspects to your data analysis. The same data set with the same information can look very different depending on how you visualize it and depending on how you choose to show it, excuse me. Uh, this uh, can change data visualization, can change the way the data is presented and the way that it is interpreted. So when we say data visualization, we just mean that uh, it's how the data is presented and uh, there's nothing too complicated about it. There are different methods, so you can visualize data in many different ways, and there isn't always one best approach. So the same data set could have multiple visualizations, and that's okay, and that's great. The same data set can um, be visualized in different ways. However, the way that you choose to show the data can change the meaning that people take from it. Here is an example of data visualization uh, that's really good. This is the data visualization of GDP of different countries in Africa. So this is a good example of data visualization because it lends itself to comparison. The I can draw, by looking at this data set, I can immediately draw meaning from it. And it's not just a spreadsheet. This data set has a real world value to it. It provides context. And uh, I, for, for example, um, the sizes of the blocks are reaffirming the data that's written in them. Even without reading the numbers, I know that South Africa's GDP is larger than Algeria's. And I'm able to tell that because they're color coded, because they're sized appropriately. Uh, here's another good example of a data visualization. A visualization doesn't just have to be a picture. 
me just play this and then I'll talk over it as it's going. Uh, a data visualization doesn't just have to be a picture, but sometimes a video is the best option, a video or a GIF or uh, an animated data set. Um, it's, these are really good options when you want to show change across time. Uh, like this one, which uses an animated heat map. So see these large bubbles that are changing color and growing in size uh, to indicate data points. This is a called a heat map. Um, and this is demonstrating the change in temperature over time. So I'll just show that again so that way you can get a sense and see why this data set uh, is uh, it's good that this data set was presented in this format because it's easy to quickly you can look at one point and watch how it changes or you can also just look at the entire data set itself and see how uh, see how the uh, how it's trending over time now this is i wanted to get to this example because this is a poor example of visualization because you can't see anything um i don't know what I'm looking at. The data is overlapping. It's unclear what the bubbles represent. Is it size, density, geography? The title is askew and it, it doesn't need to be. There's space for it to, not to be. Uh, this is just not a good visualization. There are better ways to present this information. Uh, here is an infographic, another type of data visualization. It is the best method of visualization when you have a lot of information to present. Uh, all at once and it's generally accompanied by more information. Last, there are maps. Uh, maps are a wonderful tool for data visualization. Um, and uh, we spoke more, a little bit about that earlier with OpenStreetMaps. Now I want you to take everything that you learned today and apply that learning to the challenge I'm about to set for you. Are you going to take the data challenge? Uh, I've compiled, uh, oops, excuse me, oops. Uh, I've put together some data sources, that link that I mentioned earlier, uh, where you can go and download data. Uh, it's completely free for you to use. You can go uh, there, download the data. Con I want you to start out with five data sets, convert that data if necessary. Some of it, in some cases it's not. Then create a Google Sheet with the new data that you've converted or collected, clean that data, check for the errors that I mentioned, check for errors like the ones I mentioned today, and then write down the metadata. If you have any questions, you can reach out to me. Uh, my name is Caitlin Holm. My email address is kait.holm at gmail.com. Again, that's Kate home at gmail.com. And I would love to hear from you and uh, would love to uh, help you out if you get stuck. Thank you. Oh, and I'll put my information in the chat as well. Uh, sorry, we didn't get to any questions, but you can email me. Um, I'll put my email address back up. You can email me and I will get back on gender segregated data and COVID data. Uh, if you have any questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat as well. And I'll, I think these sessions stay open for about 20 minutes afterwards, and I'll continue answering there. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to pop open that that link that I mentioned so you can get a quick look to 
uh, to see what it looks like. And then um, if you have any questions on that, I'd be happy to answer that as well. I think Florence said we had a few extra minutes. Um, so here is the toolkit that I uh, created. Uh, oh. Let's see. Okay, well, it doesn't seem to be showing, um, but you have the link up on the, the link up on the screen. So if uh, you have any questions, you can go take a look at that. Oh, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup, Bernard. Oh, uh, pardon, de rien. <laughs> So uh, the, since it doesn't seem to be showing up, the date, the sources that I've included are from the Google dataset search that I mentioned, Africa Data Revolution, uh, aid data, so this is information about the amount and use of international aid in countries, the Ghana Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, this is information related to mining, in Ga mining activities in Ghana, so it's really interesting. Um, I encourage you to check that one out. The Ghana government site.